So we're going to um, read what we have been talking about, and uh, uh, we're going to stay in John 14. Uh, and then we'll pick up where we left off. So uh, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Uh, and, uh, and you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have you been with me so long and, you, and still you don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Uh, and we talked about where heaven is. We don't know where heaven is. That's a, that, that, that I don't need to have a long discussion about that. What's more important is how do we get to, to heaven? And we get to heaven through Jesus Christ. He is the only way. To heaven, right? I am the way, uh, and and there is not another way um, to heaven. So Jesus um, is the way to heaven, uh, and then He is the truth. He doesn't just say He tells us truth or what He says is true. Both of those is, are true, but He's saying He is true which is even stronger than saying he tells. And then he is the life. True life, both now and forever, is in Christ. Not only is eternal life in Christ, life that is truly life here on earth is, thank you. Um, no, that's right. um, True life is in Christ, now and forever. Um, we talked about Ephesians saying that, that those same things as well, uh, and Colossians as well. Um, and then we talked about our assurance. Uh, we talked about our assurance of heaven. Uh, and then we don't need to read. Uh, and I read this to you, our true home, our complete security, uh, has, has already been built for us by him, by Jesus in heaven. Once we embrace the significance of this notion, our attitude toward this world completely changes. We tend to cling to what is temporal. We tend to cling to earthly things. And when we really understand our true citizenry, our true citizenry is in heaven doesn't see, and the things of this world don't see um, as, as important um, to us. And I think that's where we left off. Okay. Okay. So uh, here's the, the next uh, promise that that Jesus gives us. Uh, we're not talking about heaven anymore, so I got rid of that. Which is good because it's hard to do that. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these, greater than Jesus' work. Will he do because I am going to the Father? Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Wow. That's a pretty crazy analysis, right? 
I'm going to do greater things. You're going to do greater things than I did. Raise dead people. Right? Raise dead people. And I'll do anything that you ask in my name. Because I'm pretty sure you say no to me sometimes. <laughs> Um, so we'll talk about all of that. So the, the first thing we're going to talk about is the power um, of the gospel. Um, so um, how is it, uh, and you don't have to answer this, I'm, I'm going to answer it. I'm going to give you the curriculum answer, and I'm going to give you the, the AKV, the, the ABKV. Um, so welcome, ladies. Uh, what? There's only four of us taking down. Oh, so it's going to be really long time. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, how can it be that what we do is greater than what Jesus did? I'm going to give you the curriculum's um, answer, which I think is good and it's true. But then I'm going to give you the answer that, that makes more sense. Uh, to me. Um, so what the curriculum says is that, well, let's see if we can, let's read these first and then I'll, uh, I'll tell you. Uh, I became a minister, so this is Paul talking about himself. Uh, I became a minister according to the stewardship of God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden, so this this mystery of God, um, this this. Um, uh, the, this word of God is the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. And here's the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then in Romans 1.16, oh, we're not done. Uh, here we proclaim uh, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. And then Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because for it is the power uh, of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So here's what the, the, how can, the question we ask is, how can our works be greater than Christ's? And here's what the curriculum says. It says, through the power of the gospel, the greatest miracle of all takes place, uh, which is the salvation of human beings, right? The greatest, um, greatest uh, thing of all. Uh, and, and when we come to know Christ, we are completely uh, we are moved to a completely different place. I'm going to read a couple of verses. I might write a diagram on it. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. That's, those are Jesus' words. You're Paul's words. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of men. Here is what happens to someone when they come to Christ, Okay. Uh, so you've got these two, and I'm going to show you this again in your senior year, but you'll forget it by then. You might forget it by, um, I don't know, whatever. Uh, so we are all born in the same sphere. We are all born in the sphere of death. Jesus removes us from, hang on. Those who are in Christ, um, I do a thumbs up if I knew how to do that, but I can't, uh, are, in, are in the sphere of life. But we're not born there. We're all born in the sphere of death. And, and what Jesus is saying in John and what Paul is saying in Ephesians is that Jesus takes us out of the sphere of, sphere of death and puts us into the sphere of life, the life that only Jesus can give. 
which isn't just eternal life. It is eternal life, and that's wonderful. But even, even more, it is life now, abundant life now, and abundant life when we die. Uh, so we've been we've crossed over as as Jesus says from death to life uh, when we come to Christ. I remember that night when I crossed over from death to life, and and I knew it into every core of my being. Uh, I knew that I had been dead, which that word walk means that's the way you live. That's the way I live. Uh, and everything changed when, I, when Jesus took me and, and uh, crossed, I crossed over. So um, I think their answer is really good. But I'm going to give you another take on this. I don't think that one's wrong and this one's right. I think they're both true. Um, so, so what would make them greater? What would make um, uh, our works greater? than the works of Jesus. It can't be because they're more spectacular, right? Raising a dead body, uh, you know, healing a, a man who's blind, all those things. It, it can't be that they're more spectacular than what Jesus did. Um, I believe it's because who he is using to do them. Jesus was the son of God. Of course he worked miracles, right? He It was, it was child's play. Um, but God chooses, when he comes to live in us, to use us. Frail, sinful human being. And he desires or he uh, works in us. Even though we're fallen, even though we're present. It's one thing if Aaron, uh, on the hardest math question yesterday, I don't know what that was, but I know I can't do it, um, works that and, and gets it exactly right. It's another thing if we bring down a pre k and say, do this one problem, and he gets it completely right. It's, it's spectacular that Aaron got that question right, right? But the four-year-old? And okay, I'm gonna buy some stock at wherever you go because you're, you know. Yeah, he's using frail, fallen people to do his work. And that's spectacular. Yes. But I what? An Android charger? I do not. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an Apple one. Sorry. Okay, sorry. I hope you find one. Um, so. That would be my take on that. I don't think the other one is right and, and this one is wrong. So this is where I show you a couple of clips. I will explain them to you uh, as we go. We're going to pause the video so I don't get uh, in trouble with YouTube. Sorry, you missed Spud Web. You can look it up. Um, so, so that's why it's, it's greater. So let's talk about the power of prayer. I, I'm not sure. Oh, oh I gotta do this. Um, I'm not sure that it's um, the power of prayer. It's the power of God. Oh uh, shoot! I'm just gonna let it keep going. I know. I was doing the wood stove. I was doing the wood, and I burned my hair. I burned my eyebrows, my eyelashes, all of my baby hairs. I yeah, I know. Yeah, and now they're growing back here like it is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so then we uh, let's see. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about the necessity of of prayer. Um, 
so we, and there's, this is all about the power um, of prayer. So um, does this mean that if we uh, pray for God to move Mount Everest, that's going to happen? As we just said that? No, that'd be ridiculous, right? It'd be a ridiculous request. Um, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, that's true. Um, but um, here's the thing. There's, this is not like a formula where if you plug in the right numbers, you get the right answer. Um, that, it's, not, it's not about that. Uh, and sometimes we misunderstand um, what, what God um, is saying. So I remember reading um, this verse that, um, um, that if, if you delight yourself in the Lord, God will grant you the desire. And I remember thinking, Okay, so the desire, and this is like, this is a long, long time ago. I'm not married yet, right? I haven't even met Jeff yet. Uh, I might be in college, I don't know, but, but I'm, I'm very young. And, uh, and I think, okay, so the desire of my heart is a husband. So all I have to do is to trust in the Lord, uh, and, and he'll give me. Um, and what I, what I realized uh, was that that formula was, was wrong. Um, and I turn it on? Oh, I never turned it off. Yeah. Uh, so here's what I realized. When it says, trust in the Lord uh, and, uh, with all your heart, and do not really on your understanding, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. He will give you the, the, the desire of your heart. Um, so what I realized was, no, if he is the desire of my heart, then will he give me more of him and more of him and more of him? Yeah, he is the, the desire. If I'm delighting in him, he is the desire. And if I ask for more of him, that that's the thing I want most, I'm going to get that every time. So it isn't like there's no formula where you punch numbers in and you get your answer uh, affirmatively. Um, so, uh, so why then? Why pray? Right? What's why is prayer necessary? Well, first of all, God commanded it, and we really—I mean, we really don't need any other answer than that. God tells us to pray, so we should pray. We're commanded to do that. Um, and some people say there's no purpose in praying because God's going to do what he's going to do. I see it this way, that God is allowing us to, have, to partner with him, to have um, an opportunity to be part of his work. And that's a privilege to be able to do that. Um, and, but, we, but the only reason we need to have is God tells us to do it. And so we should. Yes. So people that are saying that you don't need to pray because God's going to give you what you need. Why would that, like, like if prayer doesn't mean you're necessarily asking for something. It's true. You can just be like worshiping God. Yeah. And the, and yeah, that's what people, people will think of when you pray is some asking of God. You're right. It's just talking to God. And you're not, you, when you talk to your parents, sometimes you say, hey, can I have? Not always asking your parents but, or something. But you're, that's not the only conversations you have with your parents. How was school day? How was your work day? Yeah, all, everything. But we don't need any other uh, reason to pray than God tells us to do. Um, and then the other thing that I heard, and I think C.S. Lewis actually said this, but I, I heard him say it, um, well, his character say it in a um, a movie called Shadowlands, which is about the life of C.S. Lewis. Oh. So, so C.S. Lewis was a confirmed bachelor for the vast majority of his life. Uh, and then he met this woman called Joy, uh, named Joy, and um, they were just friends at first, and they really enjoyed one another. But at some point, they ended up falling in, falling in love and getting married. And he, they weren't married all that long. Uh, when she got cancer, uh, 
uh, and, and died. Uh, and uh, one of his colleagues, uh, he was a professor, uh, one of his colleagues who was an unbeliever kind of trash talked him and uh, said, so did you pray for your wife to be healed? Well, then where's your God? You know, where, where's your God? He didn't answer your prayer. Well, first of all, he did. We'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But here's what C.S. Lewis said. He said, I don't pray because it changes God. I pray because it changes me. And I believe that to be true, that when we spend time with Jesus, you're like the people you hang out with, right? Uh, and so if the people you hang out with are, are working hard in school and, and uh, you know, obedient to their parents or whatever, you're going to be more like that. If you're hanging out with people that are doing stuff they shouldn't do, then that's what you're going to be. And if you spend time with God, you'll become more like him. Uh, and so that's what C.S. Lewis was saying. I, I don't pray because it's changing God. I pray because it changes. Uh, I want to make sure. So, um, and then we're to pray in um, Christ's name. To pray in Christ's name. So, what do you think it means to pray in Christ's name? Amen. Yeah, that's what most people think. So, all I got to do is I got to tack on in Jesus' name, amen, and we're good. But have you had uh, your prayer not be answered the way you want it? even though you said in Jesus' name, amen. So let's talk about what does that mean when we say in Jesus' name, amen. Um, what does it mean um, to say that? And what it means, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the, the curriculum because I think it's true, but I'm going to give you my take on that too. It means to pray for the very things Christ would do. Um, so here's how I would uh, characterize this. In ancient times, the name of a person stood for their character. It's why you hear. Is it, oh, okay. We'll pick up here tomorrow. 